What I would like to do now is just say a couple more words about the McCain Institute's efforts in human trafficking and then turn it over to our two fantastic speakers tonight. Um, the McCain Institute was established uh, a couple of years ago now uh, with a focus on character-driven leadership and applying that sense of character and values throughout areas of work, of humanitarian work, human rights, and national security. In the humanitarian area, very early on, we decided that one of the issues that needs more attention and more focus and where we can try to move the needle is the area of human trafficking. And so we have worked uh, very closely supporting the efforts of Mrs. McCain, who was named the co-chair of the Governor's Task Force in Arizona on human trafficking and is now the co-chair of the ongoing committee uh, to pursue this issue over time. Uh, we've had tremendous success, uh, thanks in large part to the awareness building that Mrs. McCain and others have done and the work of that task force. Arizona, uh, earlier this year, approved new legislation giving significant new powers to law enforcement. Uh, at the Human Trafficking Council meeting just yesterday in Arizona, uh, the FBI uh, representative present said that Arizona really stands as a model among many states for the tools that it is making available to pursue this crime in Arizona. And that's really thanks largely to the awareness building efforts and the, and the task force work co-chaired by Mrs. McCain. And we're very proud as the McCain Institute to have done some of the technical support to help bring that about. We're interested in learning more we sponsor research through Arizona State University, some original research that is helping establish a fact-driven data baseline for what sex trafficking really means in Arizona. We're interested in using technology and looking at how the internet is used to exploit people for human trafficking, but how it also can be used to track human trafficking and disrupt networks. And we're interested, obviously, in making this not only something that we pursue as an institute or that is pursued in Arizona through the task force, but something that becomes a national focus and, and an international focus so that we really do make a fundamental difference in putting this uh, heinous practice to an end. Uh, with that, I want to introduce again Mrs. Cindy McCain, who has made this one of her crusades. And when you know that she has a crusade, you just get out of the way. <laughs> and this has been tremendously successful, and we're so pleased to be working together with Mrs. McCain on this. And as you saw, we had originally invited John Ryan from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Unfortunately, he's unable to be with us tonight for some personal reasons, and we are delighted to have the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Yoda Suras. And so with that, let me turn it over to the two of you and Mrs. McCain. Thank off you. you go. Thank, Thank you. you, Kurt. Thank you. Um, first of all, we still have Heidi online. Can you hear us, Heidi? Senator, I'm sorry. I can, and I'm going to stay as long as I can, okay. Cindy. I have and, a specific um, question for you is why. And I'd like okay. you to address the, the group about our Native American issue more in depth. Um, we are. We are very concerned about what's happening on our reservations and very concerned about what's happening with urban Indian populations. And when you look at the report that was released today, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, Cindy, but it was the one that Senator Dorgan was working with the Department of Justice on. And it shows a record and a history of victimization of Native American children that is unmatched or unparalleled in this country among any other ethnic group. So taking what I said earlier, which is that the grooming of the, uh, of the, the candidate for uh, trafficking tends to go to lower income, tends to go to kids who've been victimized in the past. So automatically that puts them at a category that is hugely at risk. Um, beyond that, we have a jurisdictional challenge on Indian country uh, in the United States, especially Indian country now where we have this oil boom at the same time. So the federal government has major crime prosecutorial responsibility on my reservations, but they don't have a major law enforcement presence. It almost, and I'm not exaggerating to tell you that in many cases, it's lawlessness um, frequently on reservations and it is open season for victimization. I just talked to a tribal judge this morning who told me of um, uh, ver various conclaves or pockets within the reservation at the Mandan, Hadatsa, and Arikara Nation that 
um, they know trafficking is happening. And by the time the neighbors report it, they've cleared out and it's very mobile. And so it's very, very difficult to get a handle on. We have a natural population that is, is subject to victimization. And we have to look at this in a special category because of the jurisdictional challenges, especially when it occurs on the reservation. And frequently, the other concern that I have is for treatment of the victims. Um, I talk to prosecutors in Minnesota. We have a lot of urban Indians in Minnesota who then migrate on and off the, the reservations, on and off Indian country. Young girl left uh, by her mother in Minneapolis, falls in with the wrong crowd, needs a place to sleep, needs food, needs um, the comforts of home, gets groomed into that life. And eventually she's, she's a willing participant in a prosecution. She vanishes. No one knows where she is. No one's done the follow-up. No one's done the treatment. Yeah. Uh, and it's probably likely she's back in the life. And so we, we have such a unique issue and such a unique responsibility, I think, to um, Native children. And so we've got to segregate that. And, and Cindy knows how passionate I am about this issue and how passionate I am about um, uh, protecting the ch all children of this country, but particularly Native American children. Thank you. And we'll, you bet. we'll release you. Please go. <laughs> I don't want to keep you any longer. Make a run for the floor. Thank, thank you. you. We'll thank see you, you later, so Cindy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yoda, thank you very much for coming. Thank I you am for so pleased me. to see all of you here too. Um, I'm really I was really anxious to get that question answered from Senator Heitkamp because it is obviously an issue that affects Arizona as well and many other southwestern and western states. Um, I am so pleased to have you here I, for, for many reasons, but we were chatting on the phone earlier today and uh, to have a legal aspect of this, someone with, an, with a legal eye on it and a legal thought process on this is extremely important because that's where we're at right now nationally is, is in the process of not only formulating good legislation but passing it. And so we, I'm really glad you're here for a number of reasons. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to start with what I call a lot of these conversations. And I know there's many of you in the audience that have a history with human trafficking. You work in the arena. Uh, you're with an NGO, whatever it may be. But I would like to start with, for those online, uh, Human Trafficking 101. Can you tell us exactly what human trafficking in, what human trafficking is? And is there a real definition, one definition for it? I certainly think um, you know different nonprofits that focus perhaps on on sex trafficking or labor trafficking, et cetera, might have a slightly different definition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at NICMEC, at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, we focus on child sex trafficking, uh, and we generally would you know look at that as any scenario where a child is placed in a situation where they are trading sex for something else. It, it could be money, it could be money to a third party, it could be money to themselves, but but it could also be um, exchange for anything else, a bed for the night, right. food, etc. Yeah, shelter. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Um, I know that we were chatting earlier, and I said my biggest frustration, one of my biggest frustrations in this, when I began all this, was the disbelief that it actually occurs. That it, it, it oh, no, that happens in Cambodia. That happens in India. It doesn't happen here. Um, I met with a prominent newspaper who said just that to me, that we don't believe it exists. You're going to have to prove it to us. And this is a major newspaper. Um, so I'd like to, to find out from you what NICMIC has done to not only prove it, but to prove to, to the disbelievers, not just proving it to those of us who know it exists, but giving us data, but to the disbelievers. Sure. Well, you know, NICMIC, um, you know, began a little over 30 years ago really focusing on missing children issues. Um, we added to that a focus on exploited children issues, especially online exploitation, um, the, you know, distribution of online child pornography, for instance. And several years ago, we started to see um, a correlation between the two departments. So we started to see children who had gone missing, um, mostly runaways, who were then also turning up in an exploited case. Um, and that was you know, very eye-opening to us and really showed us uh, you know, a, a problem that was emerging. So about three years ago, we actually started a child sex trafficking team um, within the organization. Um, it is a combination of the missing and the exploited um, departments that we have so that we can actually um, bring the analytics and the information that we're receiving from, from the public 
um, and from the other resources we have to really focus on those missing children who are at risk for trafficking or who, who we know are being trafficked and, and again, who might be um, exploited and we're receiving reports from them on that side as well. Um, and we have you know, seen a, an increasing growth in those reports. Last year alone, we received over 10,000 reports of child sex trafficking. Um, and I would just add, there's no requirement for those reports to be made to NCMEC. Um, you know, that is just voluntary um, individuals and companies when they see potential child sex trafficking who are making those reports to us um, so that we can process those and pass them on to law enforcement, hopefully to recover that child. Um, in, in about the past five years where we've been really tracking these numbers, we've seen a 1,432% increase in the number of child sex trafficking Say reports. that one more time. 1,432% <laughs> increase in the number of child sex trafficking reports received at NCMEC. I can't even fathom how much that is, how big that is. And some I mean, of that is awareness, which is right. wonderful. Um, awareness right. of, of you know, NCMEC as a resource of child sex trafficking as a problem to be reported for people to reach out for assistance to children. But you know, we could also look at it as a, an increasing proliferation of the problem as well. Um, you know, online child sex trafficking, um, you know, is a huge problem. We see an increasing number of those reports in the reports we've received over the past five years. Does, does the training or lack of training on, be, on behalf, on the part of the police departments have anything to do? Are we seeing, I know more police departments are now trained in this area, <laughs> but part of that training has to do with being able to recognize that a child that is perhaps abused in front of you or, or homeless, whatever may, is also a victim of sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've had a, a, a great deal of emphasis on training in Arizona. I mean, do you, how does this play in with what you're saying? It's, um, you know, it's definitely a factor. I mean, yeah. we look at the issue of child sex trafficking as, as three main factors. It's multifaceted, of course, but identifying, locating, and recovering. Mm -hmm. um, those are huge areas, you know, of course, to cover, but identifying is, is a tremendous issue. Um, you know, we started to do some outreach and training um, not only to law enforcement, um, social workers, but also to schools and communities. I mean, those are very important, um, you know, people in children's lives who might notice, um, you know, that, that a child might be falling into a trafficking situation or, or you know, might have some risk factors for that. Mm -hmm. So it's tremendously important. I, I agree with you, Mrs. McCain. It's been um, increasing. More law enforcement are aware of the issues, are taking advantage of the training opportunities, mm -hmm. but there could be a lot more out there. Mm -hmm. That uh, was one of the largest emphasis that our task force at home took up in all of this, and I'm happy to say it's being a little bit successful, too. Um, last year, I, the reason I, I brought up the, the Native American issue with Heidi was because uh, there has been, from our calculations anyway, there were 96 human trafficking bills passed in 2014 on a state level. <coughs> <laughs> I, I, we were talking backstage, and I said, this is very frustrating because there's a lot going on. We had, in Arizona, had one bill last year. I now know of 20-some, 30-some bills that are being proposed this year. There seems to be a lot of duplication in all of this, and I, I just like your assessment on that. And, and what, do you th what should we be doing from a state level to make this a little easier and a little better? Sure. Um, first of all, I, I'd echo the fact that you know, it's tremendous that that, that that number of states and legislatures are focusing on the issue, right. um, are trying to find solutions, and, and being responsive to the community needs. Um, you know, but but it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult, I think, for law enforcement, prosecutors, and even service providers when uh, multiple bills, um, you know, are, are up for discussion or passed, might be a little overlapping, might be a little contradictory. Um, you know, I think some of the the themes that have come out in some of the pending federal legislation that has been discussed, the safe harbor issue that Senator Heitkamp, of Can course, go into the safe harbor, sure. harbor issue a little bit. With sure. Him. So the concept of of safe harbor, um, you know, really is two pronged and. One is the concept that a, a child who law enforcement perhaps has recovered from a trafficking situation is a victim um, and is a, a survivor once they get recovered, um, is not uh, a criminal who's committed the crime of prostitution or solicitation or any one of the other number of um, you know, laws that may be on, on the books statewide. Um, so it, you know, again, it's the, it's the concept that that child needs to be diverted um, out of the criminal system. Um, sometimes it's an immediate diversion um, where the child will not be um, charged with prostitution or, or other related crimes. Sometimes it is a two-step process where um, the crimes will be pending until the child completes certain um, social services and other treatment options. 
Um, so the first is really legal. The second, though, is really um, providing services to that child. When that child gets um, you know, recovered from a trafficking scenario in a sting operation or something else, they have the clothes on their back, and they have nothing else. Um, they do not have anywhere to go get their stuff and go somewhere else. They do not you know, likely have other friends or family that at that moment they can go back to. So it's also the immediate ability to provide services to that child, for that child to know where they're going to sleep that night, where are they going to be in two weeks, what's going to happen to them next, um, to really try to get them um, not only physically out of that trafficking scenario, but also you know, into a real recovery process. And that's really the concept of, of safe harbor. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's pending in, in Senator um, Heitkamp's and Senator Klobuchar's bill right now. Oh, yeah. um, and it's been the subject of a lot of discussion this year on the Hill. I know that uh, I just was out in Minnesota visiting one of uh, Senator Klobuchar's facilities that she really triumphs and, and talks about. It. And it, it indeed was a tremendous facility. Um, and it was an all-encompassing facility. Whatever girls or boys wind up in, in that uh, facility get a full range of services. And they, they have things available to them for a length of time that is, is really lovely. Um, but what th the portion of that that is also addressed, but I think in a little bit different way, is the treatment of Johns, which was just raised by Senator Heitkamp. Um, they send their... Uh, Johns in, in uh, Minnesota to John School, and the cost of the John School is somewhere in the neighborhood of $900. The monies all go to help treat these, these kids that have been so, so terribly abused, and they spend one or two days, I'm not quite sure what it is, and then they get a slap on the wrist and they're out of there. Um, first of all, what do you think of that aspect of this, and do you think it's strong enough? Well, um, you know, initially, but any, what would you do differently sure. if you were going to? Um, I mean, any preventative measure or any efforts to address demand are, are positive, and not, we know not all states are doing that uniformly or enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do think the concept of, of a John school, to use that term, um, you know, is is very inadequate. I mean, these are individuals who have tried to buy a child to predators. rape that child. Yeah. Um, they are predators and offenders. Um, you know, they 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 likely we know just given the proliferation of the crime. Um, the time that they were arrested is likely not the first time that they tried to or did buy a child for sex. Um, so the concept of having something equivalent to perhaps a, a driver's ed school for someone that's gotten too many speeding tickets so they can be you know, remediated in that sense, um, I think falls a bit short. Um, you know, it is a very violent and long-lasting crime that they perpetrate, and I think it needs to be treated as such. Well, you know, out, out west when we, uh, you know, when we began all of this, the word that we used to talk about them is child abusers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in my opinion, and, and this is just my opinion, I believe they are child abusers. And I believe that they should be treated as such. Now, there is a, there is a, a conflicting discussion out west about how we treat them well. People said, let's publish their pictures in the newspaper, which we used to do in Arizona. We don't do that anymore. And I, we raised this in our first, one of our first meetings and said, what about publishing the pictures in the newspaper? I kid you not, a law enforcement person, no names, um, said, but he might get hurt. His wife might hurt him. I, I, I mean, it's like living in, in, you know, for me, I'm like on the moon or something. I can't believe the stuff these guys say. Anyway. Um, but I don't know what's right because I do, it, shame is a great deterrent in all of this, and I like the idea of funding some of the victim services in this. But I don't. I agree with you. I don't think one day or a driver's ed school, as you put it, is necessarily the right way to go about this. No, and, and again, and should it be legislated? Uh, you know, I, I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm coming a little bit more from the legal standpoint. Yeah. I think there are some recent court decisions which are strengthening how prosecutors. Um, can approach buyers um, in this scenario. There, there was a great kind of land um, you know, breaking case last year um, out in South Dakota, um, close to Senator Heitkamp's area, uh, you know, which for the first time um, held that a buyer um, or an attempted buyer of a child for sex uh, could be treated as a trafficker. 
um, under the trafficking statute. Um, so, so a very, uh, very strong decision. Um, but it's only, you know, it only covers a few states. Um, and basically, what that does to give a little further explanation is it, is it opens up um, additional penalties um, for individuals who try to buy children for sex. Um, so, you know, that, those kind of cases I think are tremendously powerful. There's a deterrence factor as well um, when you have case law that can give sentencing of that sort to um, potential buyers who, you know, some of the studies have shown that their, their po probability of them getting arrested and the sentencing they may receive. Um, you know, they have vocalized as being big deterrent factors. Right. So, uh, you know, there's certainly a shaming, there's education, um, there's, you know, very harsh prosecution also that I think can be a powerful deterrent. And we just had a guy in Phoenix, I, obviously I'm very involved in this in Arizona, and they, there was a big sting in Tempe, Arizona, the Palma Bay issue that, to, to, to not ASU was involved, but it was the area where it was at. Anyway, uh, one of the men that was picked up in it, and these were all children that were rescued from this, but one of the men that was picked up in it had put a question on Backpage.com saying he wanted to find a cheerleader. Well, indeed, he did find a cheerleader, a 14-year-old cheerleader that wound up being a student at the high school he taught at. That's what, I, I kid you not, this just happened in Arizona. Um, it's stuff like that that's going on, but the fact is they, the sting was big, it was hardcore, and they got these guys. And let me tell you, that's the ripple of the ripple effect of this has been very interesting in Arizona. Um, you know, we have we've seen some more, but it, it anyway. I'm I'm all for big stings. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we've been talking about uh, federal legislation. We've talked about the Johns a little bit. We've talked about. Uh, the efforts that, that you all are doing, but I'd like to talk more in depth about training. Mm -hmm. Training and, um, and uh, how, we, how we educate our own communities. And from your standpoint, from the missing and children standpoint, what, I know training is very important. I know that you do that. I know that you participate and help other organizations do that. Um, but are we doing it the right way are, by just focusing on the police or should we educate the general public? Oh, I think it has to be much broader. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think to address the, the first responder need, let's say law enforcement, social workers, um, you know, individuals who are coming into direct contact mm -hmm. with these children is immensely important. And those are the first two training programs that NICMIC has rolled out. Um, you know, one directed to uh, law enforcement and prosecutors, prosecutors, and a second training program really on forensic interviewing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, individuals who are trying to draw the story out and some of the details of these children's experiences once they're recovered. But at the same time, we are also um, starting to shift and focus more on community awareness, and especially to children, um, you know, teenagers, so they can be aware of potential luring or potential suggestions that they may receive, whether it's online or otherwise, so they're aware this, this is a problem. Um, and you know, it has to be done in the appropriate manner for the age group, but um, you know, that sort of awareness is very important. And again, schools, immensely important, I think. Um, you know, some schools will, will see a child more than their own family members might, just given school schedules. Um, and their ability to notice, um, again, changes in a child's demeanor or dress or absences from school um, can be you know, very vital in either preventing an issue or you know, being able to pull back a child who um, may be starting uh, the entry into a trafficking experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure that uh, educating hospital workers as well uh, has been, because that was raised with us, and we felt not only was it important, but it was utterly necessary now kind of thing, because so many of these kids wind up in the ER or wind up, uh, you know, at some point having, in, having interaction with the medical. That's a great point. With the medical fields, yeah. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm curious about for myself is, uh, is law enforcement and the use of the word prostitution. Um, I'd like to know really what you think, you know, your view on, the, on this, and should we be doing that a little bit differently? I, I have a hard time calling a 12-year-old child a prostitute. Well, we've categorically moved away from the term prostitution yeah. within NCMEC. Um, you know, organization-wide, it is, it is not a term we recognize. It is not an appropriate term. A 12-year-old cannot be a prostitute, um, an 11-year-old, a 17-year-old. Um, we use the term, you know, child sex trafficking victim or child sex trafficking survivor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is done uniformly. There is a, a wonderful piece of legislation that's pending right now, which would actually alter um, the 
enacting legislation that NCMEC has um, to change the term prostitution, child prostitution, from one of the areas that we focus on to child sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And we think that is you know, very in keeping with, with how all the service providers are referring to this problem. Yeah. I, I, not only do I agree with that, but we at least we're trying to make a serious effort in changing the language and changing the approach to this. Um, it's difficult, though. It changes the mindset yeah. also. I mean, just to, you know, for, for law enforcement especially who might be used to, um, you know, the criminalization of prostitute and what that means and, mm -hmm. and the statutes criminalizing that sort of activity, you know, to, to approach a child and immediately think of victim or survivor and not the word prostitute in their head. Um, and for that child not to hear that term when they are, again, brought in from a sting operation or something like that, for them not to hear them themselves referred to as that term um, is very powerful also, we feel. Well, uh, uh, let's go offshore for a minute because I, I know that you all do, do, you are very, very active offshore. Um, and organized crime, because this is the bigger picture in all of this, is how organized it is. Can you, would you tell our audience and talk a little bit about organization, who this affects, kind of money involved, all those kinds of things? Sure. The, the money question is always a very difficult one. I mean, this is I think a, it's big. I'm it's, just guessing. Yeah, I think we're going <laughs> to yeah. guess it's a big number. Um, you know, it is a very deregulated business, and I, I would call it a business. Um, you know, there, there certainly are, uh, you know, anecdotal stories of, um, you know, traffickers who, uh, you know, might work together and certainly work children across the country. So they're not even localized, let's say. Yeah. Um, they might have a circuit of cities where um, they have connections or where, where they will bring um, girls and boys who are being trafficked, um, you know, around in a certain circuit. It might be in the Northeast. It might be, you know, in the Southwest. Um, but they will keep to that, um, let's say, business model mm -hmm. um, because that is one that works and one that they feel secure in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the money is um, not something that NCMEC tracks. There, there are other organizations that put estimates out. Um, you know, we know that some of the online uh, advertisers, um, such as Backpage and, and some of the other companies out there, charge for ads. Um, and they charge for escort ads only. And when we say escort ads, um, those are prostitution ads. And that includes um, ads of children being trafficked mm -hmm. as well. And, and mm -hmm. those numbers are estimated at, you know, in, in the many millions a year um, in revenue. I had someone describe this to me a while back, and actually it's, it has stuck with me. Uh, you can sell guns, drugs, uh, Animals, you know, animal parts and things that they, they collect in Africa and other places, you can sell them once. You can sell a child over and over and over again. Um, the McCain Institute has estimated that, that one child is worth in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars to a trafficker or a pimp. A half a million dollars for one child. Uh, so if you've got a stable of six or seven mm -hmm. children, you're in the money. Um, one of the things that we have talked about a great deal is the propensity for this to, go, to, to move offshore. One of the arguments that was given to us, you know, particularly, and we'll, we'll get into Backpage. I'm saving the best for last. Um, but, but a lot of these online, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, advertisings and all these things, uh, say, well, if, if, you, if you stop it here, it'll just move it offshore. It'll just, so, so we, if we keep it onshore, then we, we can watch it and we can keep control of it. That was actually said to me one time. Um, so, so I guess my question to you is, it's already offshore, and it's offshore in a major way. How far off and how far deep does this go, do you think? As far as the international spread of it? Yeah, and, and where are the tentacles leading in this? Well, you know, to speak from Nick Mick's experience, I mean, we certainly see on the exploitation side that, um, you know, child pornography images, and I'm going to, you know, relate them in some way, um, you know, is absolutely a worldwide issue. Um, you know, we receive reports um, from around the world, in including the U.S., of course. Um, but anyone with an Internet connection has the ability to, let's say, r run this business, um, post ads, um, you know, provide... Uh, trafficking victims and, and really engage in this kind of activity. So, you know, I do not think we should think of it as a U.S. problem, right. um, even if, you know, there's current examples of U.S. problems for us to address. Um, in that area, I think it, you know, is absolutely an international issue. Is this a national security issue? I, I don't know that I would 
go that far. Um, I mean, again, just from our viewpoint, we're really focusing on the children yeah. Yeah. Um, and this issue and not so much, let's say, the flow of money or information yeah. that might go along with it. Yeah, I think the, the deeper we get into this, I don't disagree with you, but, but I will add to that. Um, I think the deeper we delve into this and the farther we follow the money and the farther we follow the tentacles and all this, I think it becomes a national security problem because it's going to lead to the worst of the worst. The guys with the black flags that are, that are in these countries all over the world now, and, and uh, it's been proposed that that's what's going on. It has not been um, completely uh, proved yet. I throw that out there only because that is something the McCain Institute is working on right now to, to get into that aspect of, of human trafficking. Um, okay, two things. Super Bowl. Uh, most people, I think a lot of people are, are disillusioned and probably think, oh, this will end when the Super Bowl's over. Shut the woman up, for, for heaven's, heaven's sake. Um, does this end when the Super Bowl ends? Oh, this, this is a problem every day, everywhere. Did it begin with the Super Bowl? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't begin and end with any of the big sports events, mm -hmm. um, you know, by, by any means. Um, you know, again, it, it, it's great if there is focus mm -hmm. um, around the Super Bowl, additional discussions and things of that sort. I mean, every day is a day we should be discussing this problem. Mm -hmm. So if the Super Bowl creates and generates discussion. additional discussion, right. I think that's wonderful. Right. But it'll go on the next day. It's going on now. It'll go on next year as well. So no, no connection, certainly, to the Super Bowl per se. Well, that's been par part of our push out west is to make people understand this is just a catalyst and not the reason and not the, the end all to all of this. It is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, we are fortunate or perhaps not fortunate in Arizona, the month of January, we have five or six major events, Pro Bowl, Super Bowl, uh, the, the Waste Management Open, the Barrett-Jackson Car Show, and about four other major events just the month of January. So we're a state that, quite frankly, should have gotten our act together sooner. And, and our, we're, I believe we're going to be the, also, we're going to have the ability in Arizona to not only track this, but to collect the data that's going to mean something down the road with this. And we already are in the process of doing that, ASU and others. Um, the exciting part of this is, is that people are now beginning to understand it's real. Now, not everyone's there yet. But law enforcement, um, uh, our large businesses, our large, uh, you know, the, the, the Hotel Motel Association, all those kinds of things are now become, coming together. And that's uh, where I bring up to you the, the influences. How can the airlines help us? How can uh, hotels help us? How can the NFL help us? How can uh, all these organizations are mixed up in just this one event? How can they help? and do it in the long term? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think, again, awareness is, is number one. Um, education of their employees, especially if we're talking about hotels. Training and, edu yeah. Training and education. Um, you know, how, how do you identify this scenario maybe going on? What do you do when you see it? Yeah. Um, you know, how do you feel comfortable thinking, well, that maybe is a customer of the hotel I shouldn't shouldn't raise an issue where it's a customer of the airline, et cetera, um, you know, to understand that the criminal aspect of this um, and the need to really get involved. Um, and, you know, I think sticking with it is, is the big issue. I mean, again, wonderful if, if individuals or corporations coalesce around the Super Bowl um, to make a big push and to offer services, but it has to be sustained. Yeah. Um, it's not a problem that's going to go away right. afterwards. Right, right. Um, I tell people when I talk to them, I kind of I kind of use the old TSA adage. I can't believe I'm even agreeing with TSA <laughs> on anything, but anyway, um, uh, TSA see something, say something. Uh, we have tried to just bang that home, at least at home, on this because uh, we're not encouraging people to become vigilantes by any stretch. But if you see something that in your gut you know is wrong or something's not right with it, tell somebody in charge or tell somebody that has the ability to perhaps do something about it or look into it. Um, and, and that's been, I think, for us anyway, that's a big hurdle for us. But it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out during this time frame, the month of January and, and afterwards. Because uh, keeping it, like you said, keeping it rolling, keeping it exciting, keeping it on the front page is Absolutely. really important. It's essential. In this. Um, back page. Would you just describe to those people in the audience that don't know what Backpage is and what they do, would you explain sure. in depth? I know you've mentioned it a little bit. Sure. So Backpage is a, an, an online classified advertising website. 
Um, so it is similar to Craigslist, which some let of me, you might be Let me be interrupt here. I'm just so proud because the two owners of this are in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> just throwing that out for you. <laughs> um, it, so, so it is a website where one um, you know, could consider going um, and locating their state and, and city um, if they're from a major city and then locating advertisements for perhaps to buy a sofa or perhaps to buy concert tickets or sell a car or um, in the case especially of Backpaging given their ad volume to um, buy someone for sex. Um, they have a very large escort section um, that is broken down in, into different um, types of activities um, but predominantly, it is a site where you can click on link after link after link, um, and there will be ads of um, individuals, um, girls and boys, um, adults and children, um, who are uh, dressed in extremely revealing clothing, if you know, very little clothing also, um, in highly sexually suggestive positions, um, with text describing that individual and what they might be selling to you. Um, there's often a coded price of some sort as well, um, by the half hour, by the hour, et cetera. Um, and it, if you take a, a website like Backpage, um, you will see a, a few ads for sofas and a few ads for concert tickets and a tremendous volume of escort ads. Um, it all, it also a website where you can post for free um, to sell your sofa or to buy, sell your concert tickets, um, but you char they charge for escort ads um, and they charge by the market. So if you're in New York City, um, you know, the market rules, and that's an expensive ad. If you're in a small town in Ohio, let's say, it's a cheaper ad. Um, so, so they you know, go by the market according to the geographic location. Um, and the ads are quite steep, and that is where they make their revenue. Is it similar to what Craigslist is? It is similar in concept mm -hmm. um, What's and, different? and layout. So you know, what is primarily different is that several years ago, Craigslist, under some public pressure um, and on the heels of a, uh, a hearing on the Hill um, to question them about their business practices, um, closed down their adult section, um, which was having a tremendous problem, not only with prostitution ads in general, but with child sex trafficking ads, with children being trafficked um, in large volumes on the site. Um, you know, a lot of that traffic seems to have, if you track the time frames, moved to Backpage, um, and that area has grown tremendously on Backpage, um, you know, and they still have a full-blown, you know, escort section where they allow those ads to proliferate. And can you describe to uh, our, our audience what back, Backpage's excuse is for this and what they say they're doing to prevent this? So Backpage has, um, you know, through the media and, and hearings, um, and, and really other public occasions um, really cast themselves in the light um, of being sort of the, in, in the words of, of one of their officials, the, the sheriff of the internet. Um, so a company that is doing everything they possibly can to protect children, um, to screen ads, to report to law enforcement or to assist law enforcement when you know, there, there might be illegal activity going on um, on their website and to really be as helpful as possible regarding these ads. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that is how they sort of balance when they are criticized quite often about um, the content on their website is they say we actually are helping the situation. Well, and the, and the, the issue that they've hidden behind for so long is, is that of the Constitution and yes. freedom of speech, uh, which is a tough one. I mean, that's clearly we all believe in that, but um, in this case, I think it's a real dicey one. Uh, what's, what's pending? I know we have two sets of legis or two sets of lawsuits going on, Washington yes. and Massachusetts, yes. right? It, it's a really fascinating development. I mean, we've talked about um, you know legislation on the trafficking issue, state and federal. We've talked about kind of grassroots community awareness. Um, you know, I think there's a third really interesting um, front here, which is emerging, which is civil litigation. Um, there are two pending cases right now that have been filed against um, against Backpage um, by multiple victims. Um, they're all women um, in this scenario, but who were trafficked as young girls um, on Backpage for sex for an extended period of time. Um, there's one case that's pending in the Washington State Supreme Court, um, and there's one case that was just filed in Massachusetts Federal Court. Um, and both of these cases are very different. Um, you know, they definitely are trying to address the issues and the business practices of Backpage 
and um, as Mrs. McKay noted, um, to not allow Backpage to hide behind um, the freedom of speech or you know, what I would also refer to as the Communications Decency Act, um, which is a statute which generally protects internet service providers, um, but not allow them to hide behind that anymore. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, you know, one of the things that was, that was uh, mentioned to me from uh, some people out in Arizona was, uh, what about at least getting together with the credit card companies and working together to stop the use of credit cards on these, on these web sites, like better specifically mm -hmm. in the, of sale of uh, women and, and children? I mean, does that, does that have any ability to go anywhere or, I mean, what's your opinion? Um, you know, I, I think it's a tremendously powerful idea. Um, I mean, they, they charge for these ads. We, we know that, and the credit card is the vehicle mm -hmm. that they use to do that. Um, you know, in fairness, the credit card can also be used on other parts of the site. Right. So, you know, this is where yeah. Yeah. The, some, some of these internet websites get very difficult when you're thinking about regulating or carving out the bad activity um, that's on them. But I, I think it's an idea that has a tremendous amount of, of potential. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that we that we were talking about b backstage was uh, she mentioned them hiding behind and kind of calling themselves the sheriff of the internet. Uh, they proposed to say that they check all of these site, all of these these purchase web uh, ads uh, for age, for for propriety, for you know that making sure that everything's in line, that all of these children are protected, and that they actually turn the information over to law enforcement. Now, I know that they turn some things over to you. Uh, can you just, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, Backpage is, is one of the companies that does make voluntary reports to NCMEC. They're not under an obligation to do so. Um, so they do make reports to us um, of ads that for some reason they believe has a connection to child sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, they, they typically don't provide us much more information than that. Um, you know, we of course will, will work that report as we would any other and make it available to law enforcement. Um, but, you know, they do talk a lot about their moderation. Um, you know, how they, they have word searches and block certain words and block certain images and um, age and that sort of thing. But they, they don't have any age verification um, whatsoever on the website. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there, there are certain measures which, um, you know, they certainly could adopt um, to drastically diminish the amount of child sex trafficking on their site, and they have simply chosen not to. Yeah, they've made a conscious decision not Absolutely. to. Absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that they should go the way of, of Craigslist and take it completely down. Not, not the whole website, but the, take the, the sex ads completely off the site. But they're not listening to me. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> they're not listening. Listen, uh, we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to open it to questions. If you, if you all would like, please. Please, when you stand up and talk, do we have microphones or anything? Raise your hand and introduce us to you, please, and who, and who you're here representing or not representing. <laughs> please, right here. Mike Berry. Wait for the, right there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Berry. Good evening, Ms. McKay, and uh, appreciate what you're hearing. Uh, hearing. I have um, traveled throughout the country and familiarized myself all across the states of various organizations, and um, it is a very entangled thing. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I have for you is, what is being done with the two slave ships, Facebook and Google? Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have more concern when you take about talk about taking down Backpage, mm -hmm. uh, they only have to shift over to Mark Zuckerberg's group, and there's several people that are trying to put pressure on him mm -hmm. to not address this, and they say, well, we can't get our hands on this. Uh, the second question I have is, is that most organizations across the country um, are not addressing the rescue sides, what happens mm -hmm. to the children afterwards, afterwards right. mm -hmm. and uh, they keep going after the Johns, or they keep going after the pimps, when actually we have uh, people who have come forward that are now uh, admitting to, I'm talking about that this is a big business mm -hmm. run by madams and uh, large pimp, there's actually a pimp award mm -hmm. uh, ceremony yeah, like right. the Academy Awards in Cha yeah. Chicago, and they've given two madams, one out of Washington and another in Chicago, mm -hmm. the uh, pimp of, of the year award 
for trafficking children. Only in America. And uh, my question to you is, is why are we staying down on these lower levels mm -hmm. when there are legislative pieces that could be addressed mm -hmm. and addressing this from a business standpoint because you've got Facebook, you've got Google, mm -hmm. you've got this, the, this operation which is run by the crime families mm -hmm. and whoever. Um, and I don't see any movement on a federal level mm -hmm. as well as a state level to go after these corporations. Well, I'll answer from the, from the NGO level and then if you'd like to take a crack at some of this. First of all, the, thank you for your question. Uh, the Facebook aspect and the Google aspect, um, I've had direct discussions with them. Now, I'm a very small cog in all this. I've had direct discussions with them, not only on stopping this, but participating in fixing this. Uh, uh, Google, for instance, you know, when you, when you Google pimp on Google, what comes up? These guys dressed in furs and... Cadillacs, I mean, they glamorize being a pimp. Now, I realize we can't control information, but maybe one or two of those pictures could be some lousy guy that's got tattoos and he's in jail. I mean, maybe something. It's just a changing in attitudes. You know what I'm saying? And, but I can assure you that the, the woman that is in charge of Facebook is all over this, and she is a huge anti-slavery pers slavery person. So rest assured, there are people at top that get it, and they want to fix it. Uh, and, and that's with Facebook, I mean. And Google, Google, I believe, is the same way. They're not in this to harm anybody. Um, it's a difficult, slow transition because it's changing mindsets, it's changing uh, attitudes, it's, it's also working under the guidance of what we believe is a free and fair country that believes in the flow of information. So I leave those. You asked about federal legis legislation. I'm sorry that, that our senator is not here because I would really have liked to have heard that answer from her. Do you have anything to add to that from well, the think, legislative aspect? Sure. Or? I think there um, you know, are attempts um, and certainly discussion about you know, how to approach this from uh, perhaps a business sense, um, a regulatory um, you know, sense as well, perhaps. Um, you know, the Internet is, is fairly new, really, as, as let's say an industry at large. Um, it is, you know, facing perhaps increasing regulation in some ways, but it's, it's really crafting it from the beginning. Um, so these are very hard concepts, and as M Mrs. McKay noted, um, you know, it's a core um, belief in this country that the Internet should be free um, and open in many ways, and I think that's something everybody is for, um, with some protective measures, and it's how to put those in place that's very difficult. Um, you know, I know there's some pending legislation that... Um, you know, goes towards uh, addressing companies in particular, um, the, the SAVE Act, as it's called, that's been sponsored by Senator Kirk and others. Um, very new still, probably subject to a tremendous amount of discussion. But there are some, you know, very good attempts um, being made to address the issue from a business manner as well. I think the more that we generate discussion and concern on our part to our legislators, the further we're going to get with this. And, we're, and, and reasonable legislation also that makes, us, makes sense in all of this. It's a really hard issue. Well, I'm not, you obviously work in the issue. It's a very difficult issue. And I sometimes have to work beyond it not being a woman's issue, number one. And number two, uh, defining to our male groups out, out here, I need help from the men here. This is a men's issue too, you know, and so... Uh, I, I scold my men at home when I talk to them, not literally, but we need your help. You need to be the ones that tell your fellow uh, men in the neighborhood, this is wrong. Real men don't buy children. They don't buy children, but you have to tell them that, and you have to believe in it when you tell them. And so I really, uh, you know, I try to do my best. I'm only one person in all this, but we'll see what we can do. Yes, ma'am. Could you stand up? and Thank you. My name is Barbara and Dello, and I'm a, uh, I was a school nurse, and I have seven children, and I've heard a lot of gossip you. about this issue that has haunted me, so I came today. So I wanted to ask you if these things I hear are correct. I live in the New York area, and the gambling casinos are very popular, and if the kids get into debt, they're expected to work it off. Um, it, kids don't want to talk. Are these Be underage children that are gambling? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, well, they're high school kids. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be, most of them would be underage, yeah. Okay. Or, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's their 18th birthday they all go. Um, 
Um, or they go with fake IDs. I don't know. Um, threats of, uh, they don't want to talk because of threats of bodily harm, hurting someone you love, threats of having something on you like pictures or something you've done, or they've been given drugs to take off the edge and then they need the drugs. Um, I also uh, called the police once about a marginalized child um, and you know said they were missing and they said they don't look for them for 28 to four, 24 to 48 hours, which seems like unbelievable to me. Um, so I guess those are the kind of, and the fact that it happens to boys as well as girls. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask if that's kind of consistent with what you guys know. I'm gonna, yeah, would you take that? Sure, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with the gambling um, mentioned that, that you made it at the beginning of your remarks, but uh, frankly, all the other um, you know, factors that, that you noted for why children perhaps um, don't extricate themselves from these situations or don't seek assistance, even when they um, are brought in perhaps from a sting operation, the threats to family, um, you know, threats to themselves, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a, a drug or substance abuse um, issue, uh, anecdotally, um, you know, are all things that we have heard and seen in, in cases as well. Um, you know, children are often, um, you know, really schooled in a story to tell when they are picked up by law enforcement mm -hmm. um, and, and specifically told, uh, you know, for instance, not obviously to release their, their pimps or their traffickers' names. So, um, you know, again, going back to the organization level of this, there's a plan in place for when the child gets arrested, what it is they do so that, you know, they get out soon and, um, and that's the end of it. And threats are a tremendous um, part of it as well. Um, you know, you mentioned the last aspect about boys. You know, I don't think that can be understated enough. Um, you know, boys and transgender children as well are often really the forgotten victims. We think of girls. Girls certainly are the majority of reports, um, you know, that we see and that we read about in the news. But, you know, again, anecdotally, historically, NICMEC has seen about 1% of child sex trafficking um, reports um, concerning boys. And in the past couple of years, that has increased to 4%. Um, so again, perhaps an increase in awareness that boys can be victims of this crime, um, and just awareness of the crime in general. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, again, just a refinement of how we're looking at this problem as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, in the back, striped, striped, I'm sorry, <laughs> striped jacket, striped, striped shirt. <laughs> Hi, I'm Olivia Enos. I work at the Heritage Foundation as a research assistant in the Asian Studies Center. And my colleague and I are currently working on a paper on human trafficking in Asia. So while we, we are primarily focusing on an international aspect mm -hmm. to things, we recognize that the State Department and the US has played a really huge role in bringing about awareness. And also that there's a role for the US in modeling good human trafficking policy mm -hmm. for the rest of the world. Um, one particular area that we've been studying is the vital importance of local law enforcement. Would you guys be able to list a couple of um, really effective local law enforcement programs that are working effectively to prosecute traffickers and ensure that victims are getting the proper restitution and rehabilitation that they need? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, go ahead if you'd like to take that. I've got sure, some too, sure. so go ahead. I'm sure we can each add, <laughs> yeah, I know. add a few. Um, you know, once you go down to the state or local level, um, I think it's amazing the variety of approaches that people implement. And, you know, it's community driven as well as, as resource driven, uh, quite honestly, as well. But, you know, there, there are some states and cities that have created um, really a, what you might call a trafficking court. Um, judges that are really focusing on these issues are, um, you know, again, very um, invested in diversionary programs um, and in safe harbor concepts as well. Um, and that is a model that has been, you know, successful in, in some localities um, to really streamline the process so that you're, you're, you know, not in front of a judge or with a prosecutor who may, um, you know, not be familiar with interviewing these victims um, or, or in how to shield them, um, you know, in prosecutions and that sort of thing. So, you know, I think that concept, um, it doesn't work everywhere, but I think in, in some cities where they've enacted those, um, you know, it's very promising. It shows a high level of education on the issue. I would go to the Orange County, California Police Department. Um, they, they, are, they are pretty remarkable in what they're doing. Take a look at what they're doing, and it's a new program for them relatively new and they're doing a bang up job with it. So that would be my suggestion. We have time for one more. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Lumpkins. I'm a student at Roosevelt State. Um, 
I'm here with my teacher, Ms. Brown, my classmate. Um, my question is, <laughs> how, how and does, how and does help human trafficking affect, um, affect taxpayers? Oh my gosh. Well, there's a whole lot of money that's not claimed because this is all, a, for, for the most part, a cash only, only business with the exception of back page and those like that. Um, it, it's a huge, it, it, the, the money that is, is involved in human trafficking and the cartels that, that control human trafficking is astronomical. So it's, it, you know, and these are monies, like I mentioned earlier, that are going into the bad guys' pockets. They're not going into sustaining our roads and buildings and all this kind of stuff. It's going right into the bad guys' pockets. So uh, it, it, from a tax standpoint, um, there's no taxes being paid on it, I assure you. <laughs> I'm sure our government would like to get at it a little bit, which they should. Anything else? Thank you. No, that's what well, I Well, thanks for being here. Thank, thank you for you. Bringing, happy to be here. bringing your students, too. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, sorry. Here come, I will say thank you to all of you before Kurt comes back up. We'll get organized here. Um, but I, for all of you, I know there's a lot of you in the audience that participate in this, in this issue daily. I want to thank you for that. Um, we're only one voice, but boy, collectively, we can, do, we can, we can get at this. Uh, so I want to thank you for your day-to-day -day work in this and all the, all the things that you endure to do this kind of work, and most of all, for your dedication and devotion to it. Uh, you are giving a voice to the voiceless, and that's very important. Kurt? And thank you, Yodi, for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. very determined, very informed advocates for stopping this practice, and I want to thank you for devoting your evening to this as well. Uh, please, as you go out from here, do talk about it. Do share what you've learned here or what you've heard about here. Look into it. It has to be a community-driven uh, approach to change. And I think that's what we're hearing from Mrs. McCain and, and Ms. Suarez, and uh, thank you again for coming, and please join me again in thanking the two great thank speakers. You. Before you all leave, may I say this, um, the Kane Institute is not a think tank. We're a do tank. We're an action tank. So everything that we undertake has a purpose and a way to get involved with it. Uh, that's what I encourage you to do. We can, I, I, obviously we need our people to think and, and, and do these things for us, but we need to get active, more importantly, and that's where we rely on you. Thank you. Thank you.